church families of meetings for us to mark the 150th anniversary of the congregation here in the Reformed Presbyterian Church in Dermara. And we do uh, trust that as God has bl will bless you in being here today, that you'll be able to come back and share with us in some other of the events that are planned in God's purposes over this coming week. We have some invitations for that on the vestibule table. You've not already received them. And, and part of it also, we have special uh, children's and family fun day tomorrow. It's our 150th birthday party, so the children will be taking part and there's leaflets, uh, information for that. It's from 3 o'clock uh, to 5 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. And then various speakers will be taking part. We're having a special anniversary service. And, and we have a series then throughout the week, 7 o'clock on Lord's Evening and 8 o'clock throughout the week. Our special focus is Christ in the Psalms. And what a great topic just suggested to us by our love for the Psalms and also by the number 150. Uh, as we see marked here in the lovely floral display here as well. So it's an opportunity that we share together and we thank God for his goodness to us. And also, we're not just looking back, we're looking to the ongoing work today, and we're looking for the work and the coming days until the Lord returns. And so as we're thinking this evening of the history of uh, the congregation here, we're wanting to put it in the context of the wider history of the Reformed faith and the common history of the Presbyterian uh, denominations and looking back, of course, to our rock, which is Christ Jesus. And our special guest in speaking this evening is Professor Robert McCollum, who's part of our own history here, having been um, inter-moderator here on various occasions. It's lovely of you and your wife, Sandra, here with us. Uh, we often say you're no stranger, but you probably know everybody here anyway, so there are no strangers to you either. Uh, you do lecture uh, specifically in Reformed Presbyterian history at the college, and so you'll be putting the history of the congregation here in that wider context. And just uh, uh, some of you have an interest and connection too with our congregation here. Um, there's a table over on this side in the meeting room where I've brought some of the historical records that I have in a safe place at home. And there's some of the original, there's the original session book there. Some of you already seen um, your marriages recorded in them. And that's going back to these books remaining from 50 years. If you're, I know many people have some in their home, but there may be some folk uh, new to the congregation and will not have this book. It's, it's very well written books, very interesting and very complete. And uh, so if you, if you want to have a copy of this, please do take some. I have probably about a dozen or 15 there. And please take them. They're free. I've kept a few back for records, but they're no good in the drawers. We might as well have them. And so uh, please do take them and uh, read them. But it is an opportunity to thank God for all his goodness to us and to be mindful that he is the one who guards us and guides us. Uh, we enjoy our fellowship here. Uh, we enjoy, we'll enjoy a further time of fellowship afterwards and the tea it has been provided. But it is an opportunity as we mark God's steadfastness. God, through the prophet Isaiah, was speaking to a people facing very difficult times. And people who were living under uh, a difficult and, and wicked king but God reminded them that he kept his promises and he had not forgotten his people. The cry from God's people was in Isaiah 49. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. The Lord says, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget Yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. As we come to this evening when we thank God for his continuing goodness, we'll commit our time to God in prayer. Let's stand together in prayer. We'll pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you're the one who has not forgotten your church. You're the one who has sustained your church according to your covenant promise that you would send the seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. 
and how you have bound yourself repeatedly to your people, that we know those blessings through Christ of the promises to Abraham that through his seed all nations would be blessed. We thank you for the precious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we thank you too for uh, how you are long-suffering and patient, how you use faulty and sinful human beings in your church to proclaim your gospel. And when we are weak, when we call out to you, then we are strong in the things of the Spirit. And we know the power of your precious word of the witness here in this place. And we think also of the witness and work of the church in centuries before. But we thank you for those who have prayed and labored and witnessed that we might continue in this place. And that even looking back to the heritage that we have uh, for our friends and families serving Christ in other parts of your church, we pray that you would be a blessing to all of us. That as we're gathered, our hearts will be alivened, our hearts will be changed. But we will be filled with thanksgiving for your, your goodness and your grace towards us. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, as Professor McCollum will come and, and then speak to us about the history of, of the church, um, at the end, we're congregation for uh, an, an outing, a, a trip to see some of the Covenanter sites in Scotland, and Gareth then will come and then talk to us a bit about that, and then we'll have some supper afterwards. Uh, so again, you're very welcome, and we invite uh, Robert to come and address us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Geoffrey, for your break. Geoffrey's been making reference to this is the, the beginning of uh, a week or a week and a half almost of uh, commemoration and celebration uh, for this famous anniversary, and we trust that will be a time of blessing for this congregation and for all who gather over the next number of days. Yes, my association with Dramara goes back to the summer of 1974. In July of that year, I traveled on a Saturday afternoon to the Kilbrony Centre in Newcastle uh, with my youngest brother. Uh, he was attending junior boys camp and I made my way from Newcastle to the Somerville home at the fort where I enjoyed a kind and generous hospitality uh, from my hosts, William and Margaret Somerville. After a good night's sleep, a good night's rest, and a healthy breakfast, I made my way here to the meeting house in Dramara. At that time, I just completed my first year at the Theological Hall. into existence in 1874, but he carefully documents the first hundred years of the congregation. 
And I trust that if you have the opportunity to read the book again, if it's lying uh, in some corner of your home, or if not, pick up a copy this evening. Uh, I can't go into all the details that Robert so carefully lays out in that volume. This evening, it is my purpose to take you back a little further and to draw your attention to the rock from which you were hewn, or to use another metaphor from Isaiah 51, verse 1, to draw attention to the quarry from which you were dug. The entire verse reads, Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Most of you, if not all of you, are descended. Thunderings were such that the people, quote, finding themselves condemned by the mouth of God, speaking in his word, fell in such anxiety and terror of conscience that they looked on themselves as altogether lost and damned. Now, it was right and proper that Glendenning should have preached uh, the moral law. And through preaching the law, the sins of the people were exposed and condemned. Now, the remarkable thing is this. The number of people drawn to Glendenning's preaching grew and grew until there were actually thousands present. Obviously, they were drawn by the Spirit of God. And not only did they attend the preaching, but they came under deep conviction of sin. The terror of the Lord came upon them because of their evil doings, because of their iniquity, because of their flagrant breach of God's moral law. Like the Philippian jailer, it appears that they were earnestly crying out, what must we do to be saved? They were ignorant of the way of salvation. And Glenn Denning, who was a bit of an eccentric, seemed incapable of moving on to present the remedy to these thousands of precious souls in that district under conviction of sin. But help was at hand. Josiah Welch, the grandson of John Knox, heard about what was happening in Oldstone, and he hurried there to apply the healing balm of the gospel to those who had been cut to the quick by Glenn Denning's razor-sharp application of the moral law. Other ministers joined Welsh, and the preaching of the grace of God, pointing to the cross and to that fountain that was open for uncleanness, to cleanse from sin and from iniquity. And as a consequence, the Spirit of God worked mightily among the thousands who were there, and multitudes were saved. The new converts needed to be taught, and the monthly meeting was established in Antrim. And it was on a particular day of each, each month. And on that day, several ministers would come to instruct the new converts in the doctrines of the faith. Four sermons by different ministers during long summer days. And then as the daylight hours got shorter in the winter, the sermons were cut down to three, and uh, they weren't uh, half-hour sermons, let me tell you, more like maybe an hour and a half each. But the people were hungry, and they were receiving the word with gladness. This went on from 1625 to 1632, and were attended not only from, from that area of Antrim, from, but from people all over the north were converging on Antrim. And as a consequence, a solid, reformed, Presbyterian, and evangelical church was established in the north of Ireland. Now, after 1632, the tide began to turn against Presbyterianism throughout the British Isles, and that included Ulster. The monarch at that time, the king, Charles I, regarded Presbyterianism as a system of church government not fit for kings. He favored episcopacy, a system of church government of which he would be considered the head, so he would be calling the shots. Pressure was put on the ministers in the north of Ireland, 
And many of them had to flee back to Scotland to escape persecution. Uh, Men like Robert Blair and Josiah Welch and John Livingston. Back also in Scotland, pressure was being put on the Presbyterians to conform to Episcopacy. The reaction of Jenny Geddes throwing her stool in the direction of the pulpit where Dean Hanney was about to read from the prayer book started or was a catalyst for the whole population to resist these impositions. And then this opposition led eventually the following February 1638 to the signing of the National Covenant in Greyfriars Churchyard in Edinburgh. Presbyterians in Ireland were forbidden to sign this covenant. Heavy fines and imprisonment awaited them if they did. Then the next decade, 1640s, the Civil War in England broke out. In 1643, the the Scots Covenanters, Presbyterians, joined forces with Oliver Cromwell and the Puritans in opposition to the king. And this agreement between the Scottish Covenanters and the Puritans was in the form of a signed covenant, the Solemn Legion Covenant of 1643. The next year, Ulster Presbyterians had the opportunity to sign the Solemn Legion Covenant, and thousands did so across the province. And the slide you're looking at reveals the various locations across the east and north and west of of Ireland where the covenant was signed. Then this covenant was renewed again in 1649, just five years later, uh, by Presbyterians across the north of Ireland. And this meant that by that time, practically every Presbyterian uh, in, in Ireland was a covenanter. Just going back to the Westminster Assembly meeting in London, they did so from 1643 to 1648, uh, while all this was going on. And the outcome of that was the production of the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms, as well as the Directory for Public Worship. The Catechisms, of course, being probably the most familiar to you in the present day. At a meeting of the Synod of Ulster here in Ballymena in 1659, when events were conspiring to to crown Charles II as king, delegates from the Synod of Ulster were sent to lobby the courtiers to ensure that the king was restored on covenant terms. That's just to, to bear witness to the fact that Uh, They were covenanters uh, themselves. But that was not to be. Charles II was not long on the throne until Presbyterianism in Ireland was outlawed and the covenants were considered traitorous. 61 of the 68 Presbyterian ministers in Ireland at that time were ejected from their pulpits and deprived of their livelihoods because they refused to conform to the king's wishes. The ejected ministers resorted to preaching on the hills and moors of Scotland in many isolated and secluded locations here in the province. During this period of persecution, Scottish ministers like Alexander Peden ministered to the Covenanters in Ulster, often riding on horseback from one location to another. And uh, I think it was the the 1970s when a stone was erected in memory of the work of Alexander Peden at Misty Burn Glen Whary. And at that location, conventicles are still held periodically. By 1670, a compromise in Ireland was reached The authorities said that the ministers could have their Presbyterianism as long as they relinquished attachment to the covenants. 
to reward the ministers at that time for accepting the compromise, they were granted what was known as the Regium Donum, or the King's Gift, something that Presbyterian ministers still benefit from to this present day. And there's a stone outside Hillsborough Castle commemorating the favor shown uh, to Presbyterian ministers who conformed to the king's wishes. But not all the ministers caved in. Uh, the Reverend David Houston was a notable exception. Several thousand families also refused to accept the king's terms and remained resolutely attached to the covenants. Of them, leaders and an- a presbytery was formed in 1763. Eason, he states, in, in uh, his history of Presbyterianism about the Covenanters, the fidelity with which their ministers preached the peculiar doctrines of the gospel was undoubtedly the grand secret of their progress. Milestones in the 19th century were the, the publication of the denomination's magazine, The Covenanter, or The Covenanter Witness, in 1830, the establishment of the Theological Hall in 1854, and then I make mention of the 1859 revival because it brought immense spiritual blessing across the province. That brings us to the year 1874 when the dispute arose in First Ramara. The majority of the congregation wanted to wait until a student was available and then to call him uh, to be their minister. He had preached uh, as a student in First Ramara frequently. But the Presbyterian authorities thought otherwise. This led the majority to re- withdraw, and on the 11th of February, 1874, they petitioned the Eastern Presbytery to be received as a congregation of the Reformed Presbyterian Church. That's exactly 150 years ago, uh, this coming Sabbath. That petition to the Eastern Presbytery was granted in May 1874 uh, at a meeting of the Presbytery. A wooden building was constructed, and it only took them a couple of weeks, and I'm told it held uh, 600 people. That was in June 1874. Services began beginning of July 1874. The first elders were elected on Sabbath the 26th of July 1874. 347 persons were admitted to the membership and 300 persons partook of the First Communion. It had been planned for, for the beginning of August 1874 But because of an early harvest, it had to be postponed until the 1st of October, 1874. Between these two ministers on the screen, you can see the ticket for the opening services of the new building on Sabbath the 27th of February, 1877. And I imagine it's still the the four walls that, that we are in here this evening. The cost of that ticket was uh, what that sum might be like today. The preacher was the Reverend Josiah's Chancellor, uh, the Minister of Governor Road. He preached at the morning service. And Dr. Thomas Houston, uh, who had spent, well, spent all his ministry in Bracken, he preached in the evening. The first minister in Dramara was the Reverend Torrance Boyd. He was installed on the 13th of January, 1875. Torrance Boyd and his wife experienced much sorrow and grief, not from the people in the congregation, because they were, they were well received and, and he enjoyed a, a very happy ministry here but the, the sorrow and grief came through the death of their young daughters who were stricken down with ter- tuberculosis. The daughters were born prior to their coming to Dramara, 
and all died in the mountain. The tombstone was erected by their parents in loving memory of their children. Ellen died on the 2nd of June, 1883. Fanny died on the 16th of April, 1887, at the age of 19. Margaret died on the 6th of November, 1888, at the age of 22. Annabella died on the 21st of December, 1888, age 16. And the fifth daughter, Lizzie, died in her teens. And she's not on the headstone because she was buried at Tamlach, just outside Rimbolg, where the grandparents lived. A devastating lot. You would think these children were, were reared. Uh, all the difficulties were over. And they're at the age of 13, 19, 22, 16. And another teenager dying because of TB that was rife in those days. Well, Torrance Boyd, rather than sinking into a deep depression with such a devastating loss, seemed to be invigorated by it and preached mightily and goes down in history as a mighty preacher of the gospel of the grace of God. Torrance Boyd was instrumental in having the manse built and that was to complete an excellent suite of buildings which served the congregation well down through the years. The slide shows all the ministers who occupied the pulpit in Dramara. Torrance Boyd, already mentioned from 1875 to 1890. John McKee, 1891 to 1897, and then what was quite unusual, Torrance Boyd was called back again, and uh, he served the congregation well for another nine years until 1907. Then William Warnock from 1908 to 1923, and Alexander Gilmer from 1924 to 1952, whom I never met, but I heard plenty of stories about him. In fact, uh, he would often be invited to participate in communion in Ballyclaber, the congregation where I was brought up, and he was one of my father's favorite preachers. So uh, uh, that's that's something that I heard about as a a young person. Then I had the privilege of enjoying fellowship with uh, the last five ministers on the list. J. Rennick Wright, uh, he uh, grew up in Ballyclaber, uh, the congregation of my childhood and youth. His father, in fact, J.R. Wright, baptized me in 1950. And then it was a, an immense privilege for me to share a mission with, with Rennick Wright in 1997 in, in Lisburn, when, when he, no, Ballyclaber, sorry, when he came back to, to share in uh, One of their anniversary services, I think it was their 200th anniversary in 1997. His grandson, Brian Wright, is now the RP minister in Sterling, Kansas. Brian did a a, a short-term placement with me uh, back in, I think it was 2016, and we still have contact with each other. Three weeks ago, I had an email from him, and he spoke of enjoying being what is a healthy congregation there in Kansas. So the Wright family is still making its mark for the Word of God and the covenanted work of Reformation on both sides of the Atlantic. Robert Hanna, as I've told you, is enjoying his retirement in Ryland's nursing home. He just recently celebrated his 92nd birthday Uh, That Ryland's nursing home is outside Kells in County Antrim. Uh, I visit him regularly, and uh, he takes a keen interest in all that is taking place in the church, especially in this anniversary celebration in uh, Dramara over these days. Robert Robb, as you know, is faithfully serving the Lord in Belenin and Ballylane, RP Churches, 
After ministering in Limavady and Enniskillen of the world over the years, now this list on the screen may, may not com- be complete. Some of you could correct me if, if I have made any omission. I have been pleased to be acquainted, I think, with all of them at some stage or other, except for the Reverend Hugh Mack, who was well before my time. Hugh Kennedy Mack, who went to Geelong, Australia. Minnie Cashew, who went to Lebanon. Uh, Myrtle McKelvey, Nee Skelly, who went to South Africa. Warren Skelly, at Nigeria. Tom Beck, Dublin. Malcolm Ball, France. Linda Corey, CEF, uh, Romania. Lily Weir, Nee Bell, CEF, the Isle of Man. And George Ball, to Australia. A very special experience that I profited from immensely was serving alongside Tom Beck in Dublin as part of a mission team during the summer of 1974, 50 years ago this July. And it's good to see present here this evening two of the people on the list, at least two anyway. Uh, Maureen, it's lovely to see you again. Uh, And Malcolm, of course. Malcolm... And I have enjoyed experiences going back many years, first of all at Queen's University in Belfast, then at the Theological Hall, and then as colleagues in the ministry ever since. Having made reference to Malcolm leads me to remember the men whom God gave from this congregation to serve Christ in gospel ministry. By all your need, just renovated, extended the church building on the Nettle Hill Road. Appeals for financial help were issued, to which you and Dramara responded generously. <clears throat> and members of Dramara in those early years were foremost in supporting the evening services. Then, when we held a mission or a Bible conference week, we were always guaranteed good support from Dramara members. <clears throat> of course, of most importance was your prayerful support The effect of prayer cannot be measured. All we can say is that it is indispensable. Prayer is indispensable for the work of God's church here on earth. And then the next church planting ministry was Dromore. We can call it a new work in an old place. Covenanters had been worshipping in Dromore since the end of the 18th century. The small congregation suffered various setbacks during the 19th century, and in 1898 was placed under the care of the Dramara session. A monthly afternoon service was begun, later held bi-monthly, <clears throat> the services in Dramara, in Dramara being taken by the Dramara minister. It could, could be said that by the 1980s, the witness in Brewery Lane was hanging by a thread. Should it close, or should an attempt be made to revitalize the work? The latter option was chosen, and with the Dramara minister and the Dramara elders involved in the oversight, the Dramara members committed themselves to the work. A new congregation was established in 2007, a congregation which is now self-governing, self-supporting, and is seeking through evangelism and mission to be self-propagating. Thanks again are due to Dramara for its practical and prayerful support in promoting and establishing the work in Dramore as a set witness in this side of the presbytery. <clears throat> Day 15. The old building served you well, but the changes that we see all around us here this evening means that you now have a meeting house and ancillary rooms that will serve you well into the future. I know that when the Synod met here in 2016, Everyone present was very impressed at how tasteful, attractive, and comfortable 
your renovated church building is. The 150th anniversary is a time to look back and acknowledge what the Lord has done. But it's also a time to look forward and anticipate what God will do through your witness. You have a good spiritual heritage. The great spiritual truths rediscovered at the Reformation are summed up in the church's motto for Christ's crown and covenant. This heritage is too precious to keep to yourselves. <clears throat> that would be selfish. That would be sinful. <clears throat> you must communicate the gospel to the next generation and to your friends and to your neighbors and indeed to the whole community. <clears throat> 77 years ago, in the year 1947, just after my father and mother were married, there was an anniversary service in Ballyclaber, their congregation. <clears throat> the preacher at that time, or on that occasion, was the Reverend A.R. Wright, a cousin of Rennick Wright's. And in his closing remarks, he said, by way of challenge to my parents' generation, the torch of covenanted truth has been handed on to you. Hold it aloft and then pass it on to your successors. Instead of the fathers shall be the children. I'm thankful tonight that my parents picked up that challenge as a young married couple. I'm also thankful that they held aloft the torch of covenant of truth through their lives and by their witness and passed it on by the grace of God to their six children. And that each of us were enabled by grace to lay hold of it. Instead of the fathers shall be the children. I am, I'm exceedingly thankful to see Dramara being blessed again with Christian young people and younger couples. And I trust that Jesus Christ will bless you abundantly. And that in your witness for Christ in Dramara, you will write a good history in your own generation to the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for the extension of his kingdom. The torch of covenant of truth has been handed on to you. Hold it aloft, and then pass it on to your successors. Instead of the fathers shall be the children. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which... Well, on behalf of the congregation, I want to thank you, Robert, very much for your talk tonight and for the research that you've put into it. Um, I think it's been a great way to kick off our anniversary week. And I hope it's inspired us to know something more of our covenanting history. And as a climax to our anniversary celebrations this year, we're planning a one-off congregational tour to Scotland to see some of the places where our spiritual forefathers lived and died for their faith. And we're launching the tour today. I've got brochures, which I'll give out afterwards. And I want to explain a little more about it. It's going to take place on the 26th to the 28th of June. Now, I know it's the last three days of the school term. Um, the accommodation would be fully booked over the school holidays, so that's why it's then. But I'm sure there'll not be too much done in school at that time of the year. And I hope that our children would learn much valuable history by coming with us on this tour. So we would encourage families to make this a priority and to come and join with us. Now, the tour will be professionally guided by Jimmy and Helen Fisher of Scottish Reformation Tours, which is a ministry of the RP Church in Scotland. We're going to travel around famous uh, Covenanter and Reformation sites in the southwest of Scotland, 
Places like Wigton. Uh, you may have heard of the two Margarets who uh, were drowned in the Solway Firth for their adherence to Christ. I remember first hearing that story in, in William's Sabbath school class. And William told us about that. And I have went to that site several times since. And it's a really wonderful sh- and drum clog. There will also be an opportunity for shopping or sightseeing, as you wish, in the lovely coastal town of Ayr. We'll be staying for the two nights in Gowan Bank, which is a residential centre owned by Scripture Union Scotland. It's a Victorian country home set in six lovely acres in the village of Darvo. Now, it's not hotel accommodation. We want to try and keep the costs down, but it's very comfortable. It has a nice garden, a meeting room and dining room, a games room, and ten ensuite bedrooms of different sizes. Breakfast and dinner will be provided for us there each day, and you'll be able to purchase your lunch while you're on tour. Now, the church has agreed to subsidize the cost of this trip to make it as affordable for as many as possible. So we're charging £250 for adults, £80 for children, and infants are free. And this fee will cover your ferry and coach travel, ensuite accommodation, breakfast and evening meals, and tour guiding. So I hope you feel this is a reasonable charge for all that's being provided. We do need numbers by the end of next month, but we can give you the option to spread the cost into the following month. At our morning service last week, our minister put the question to us, who do you think you are? And it reminded me of the TV program by the same name. I encourage the younger family children. One of the promises that we make is to teach them the history of the RP Church. How faithful have we been in doing this? Here, the church is providing you with a wonderful one-off opportunity to teach them our spiritual heritage. And surely this will help them to grow up to love the church and its great King and Saviour. Questions, um, if you don't mind standing up again, Robert, um, about the value of visiting places like this in our Reformation story. Robert has been a keen student of Covenanter history for many years, as, as you can see from tonight, and he has led various trips to Scotland over the years when he was minister in Lisburn and also in his retirement. Um, could you tell us, Robert, briefly about some of the trips you've made to Scotland? Well, I'll begin with something that may appear quite insignificant at the time, but I was part of a mission team that went to Wishaw in 1974. And the minister in Wishaw took us out one afternoon uh, to a place called Rullion Green. Presbyterian covenanters in the southwest of Scotland were horrific in those days. They were being plundered uh, by the soldiers. And so eventually uh, there was an old man being set on a hot gridiron as punishment. Uh, you can imagine what that meant. He was naked and to be left on a hot gridiron just to, to fry him, to burn him, uh, to scar him for life. That sparked off a protest movement. And eight or nine hundred uh, men marched to Edinburgh thinking that the government would be sympathetic to their cause. Instead of that, they sent out an army with guns and, uh, and those who weren't killed on the field were later captured. The monument in the Pentland Hills commemorates that and it, it, it awakened in my heart a love for the Covenanter story and uh, the cost of taking a stand for truth and righteousness that we all should do at any time in history. That's that, 1974 then. Uh, the next big event in my mind is uh, 1985. <clears throat> I was then minister in Lisburn, and it was the 300th anniversary of the two Margarets being drowned in the rising tide of the Solway. And on that particular occasion, 300 people from the north of Ireland here and also in Scotland con- converged on in Wigtown, and a service was held uh, there at the, the site of the, the burial of these two, two, two Margarets. And I can remember the sermon preached by Ted Donnelly on that occasion, 
uh, and he took it on Romans chapter 8, a passage of scripture that Margaret Wilson, the 18-year-old, read before she was drowned, how that we shall, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ, no matter what the form of persecution is, but that we shall be more than conquerors through him who loved us. And upon me as well, and I think on our family, because we were all there, and uh, I think upon the Lisburn congregation, because a, a good proportion of them were there. So that was, that was a memorable event. Got to learn about by James Guthrie uh, and his heroics for, for the covenanting cause. And then we, we did a went round to uh, places like Stra- uh, Drumclog, to, to Sanquer, to Moniave, uh, right down to Dumfries, and then across the south to uh, Simon Rutherford country at Anworth. So that, that was our trip most recently. And uh, I'm really, I was really encouraged to hear that you're doing something similar. Um, could you put a value on the spiritual benefit of, of going to see sites like this for our peace today and even for the younger <clears throat> Well, the way in which I want to, to put the value is this, that, that I'm increasingly aware that as Christians... I just put it being marginalized in our society. And pressure is increasingly brought to bear upon us to compromise the faith. And to do that by by, uh, uh, acknowledging the legitimacy of the LGBTQ movement and the trans movement, uh, that that's a legitimate expression of, of humanity. Uh, It's not. It's sinful, but they want us to celebrate it with them. And if we don't celebrate it with them, uh, teachers in the classroom, uh, across the medical profession, whatever, then pressure could be brought to bear upon us. So the covenanters teach us of the 17th century to, to, to bear the cost, whatever it may be. For them, it was being drowned in the Solway, one, 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 the, one of the deaths that made a big impact on me was a 16-year-old, a 16-year-old boy sitting reading his Bible. And when the soldiers saw him do that, they shot him. June 1688, and that's commemorated at Sorn. And to see his headstone brings home to us the fact that it wasn't just the, the ministers, it wasn't just... Uh, Some older people, but boys and girls were affected by it as well. So we need to take our stand for truth and not to compromise. And I believe it will get worse. And pressure will be brought to bear upon us to to conform to this world and its thinking. But we need to, by the grace of God and the strength of Christ, to take our stand as they did in their day. And seeing these sights and seeing what it cost them uh, uh, should, should give us a bit of backbone take a stand in our own day and not to give in, not to, to, not to give way. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Why did your appetite to come with us? Now, I know there are, are some visitors with us tonight, too. You're very welcome uh, to join with us in our history and our anniversary meetings. But if you'd like to come on this trip, come and see me. I'm sure we, we can fit you in as well. Um, if, if, if you're interested in this, I'm sure we would have a, a great time going to these sites together. So I'll give out the brochures afterwards, but I'll just hand over to our minister now to close our meeting. Again, just want to emphasize what Gareth said, our our deep appreciation to Robert uh, for highlighting so many of God's goodness towards us in days past. And the same God and the same promises in which we can be assured as Christ continues to to reign and to rule. It's an important time when we give thanks for the common heritage that we have in Christ and for the knowledge that we have. We trust that we are joined together in Christ Jesus And what a joy as we think of the Psalms so essential and central to the church in the history of the church, particularly in times of trials and persecutions and central also in our own lives that tell us about Christ and tell us about the the rule of Christ. 
But how important it is that what we do build, we build on the rock that is Christ Jesus. Psalm 127 tells us, if we turn in our psalm books in the pew in front, if you turn to number 127, it reminds us that unless the Lord builds his house, we build it in vain. We can talk about history, we can talk about our heritage, and those things are of interest. But without Christ, without the centrality of the Lord Jesus, he is the one upon whom our hope is built. And the message we proclaim that still brings light and deliverance to mankind. We are, as Bible uses the picture in the Psalms, as I in the city on a hill, we are the light and a stand to draw men, women, and children to Christ. And isn't it wonderful that what we do then is not in vain? Uh, we give God thanks for what has been done in past days that are not in vain. If we think of that book of, of Reverend Hannah's, it lists so many that serve in the church. We think of those men and women and young people, those who went to serve in ministry and mission, uh, both long-term and short-term, those who served faithfully in session and committee, those who served in Sabbath school. And we, uh, I hear the influence of many godly Sabbath school teachers that, that you bear testimony to that, and godly parents and, and those family members that really pointed us to Christ. Isn't it wonderful that we give thanks to God for all his goodness? And the greatest way to give thanks is to be fully committed to the work of Christ in our own hearts and commit our future completely to him, the one who we know who is faithful. This psalm speaks to us of the importance of building all in Christ, knowing that our labors are not in vain, and knowing also that we're thinking of instead of the fathers will be the sons. We're looking forward to that future of the church when we will be presented that spotless bride for the returning Lamb of God. So we'll stand together and sing 127 and then remain standing to close in prayer. history of your church that we have heard this evening. We think of many who have even given all for the Lord Jesus Christ, but have received so much more in your presence. We thank you for all who have been victorious in Christ and gone on before. And yet the challenge remains for us to be faithful right through our lives and to be faithful to the call to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we've been able to gather here this evening. We think of other gathering by other means. And we pray that we would know your blessings this night and our time of fellowship and with the food for which we are grateful. And also in these meetings in this weekend, gather also the lost to the cross of Christ and that together we will know that great rejoicing 
in the glorious times ahead. For these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much for coming this evening. It's been a great encouragement to us all. And we really appreciate those who have organized the supper this evening. So we've just waited a few moments about a leaflet for the Reformation tour. And the night is yours, so spend as long as you wish chatting, meeting old friends, and spending time together. So thank you very much. Thank you.